come on, let's give him praise. Oh, Father. Oh, Father, we thank you that you are here and that you are present. We thank you that you are great in every way. We worship you. We want to welcome all of our campuses with us today in Crossroads, Colleyville, and McKinney into our online community. We're going to just take a moment here before we go to the Word, and we're going to receive communion. Today is Pentecost Sunday. And here's what I can tell you. There were three events that God required that all of the men in Israel to make their way to Jerusalem. There was Passover. And we celebrated Passover or the resurrection of Christ 50 days ago. So Pentecost in the Greek is pente means 50. There's another term for this particular holiday in the Jewish vernacular. It's called the Feast of Weeks. It's seven weeks from the Passover. And what is significant about Pentecost is that in the Old Testament, Moses had gone up on Mount Sinai and they had been delivered 40 days, 50 days earlier from the land of Egypt, from the hand of Pharaoh. When Moses went to the mountain, the Lord gave him the Ten Commandments. But while he was in the mountain, the people began to rebel. They began to act a fool. They began to play the harlot. And when Moses comes down, there's pandemonium and chaos in the camp. Moses breaks those tablets, and then the judgment of God comes. And on that day when the law was introduced, 3,000 people died. Because here's the reality about the law. The law serves its purpose. The purpose of the law is to make us aware of sin. The scripture says that if the law had not been introduced, we wouldn't know that there's such a thing as sin. So when he says, don't steal, there was a lot of stealing going on and there was no conscience pricked because nobody knew that stealing from one another was wrong. But when the law came, then you became aware of sin. And so here's what the law produces. It has always produced death. Why is that? Because none of us can keep the whole law. None of us can keep the whole law. But then what happens? We fast forward and we come to Christ and he comes into the earth and the spirit of the Lord rests upon him when he baptizes. And let me tell you why he got baptized. He got baptized not under John's baptism, not because he was filled with sin, not because he had violated the law, but he got baptized because he was identifying with us in our sin. He was identifying with us in our lawlessness. And so he lives. And the scripture says this, that he did so many good things that all the books in the world could not even record all the great things that he did. So he lives. And then he's crucified and then he's buried and then he's raised on the third day and he walks the earth for 40 days and then on that 40th day when he ascends to heaven before he goes he says to the disciples he says go to Jerusalem and you wait and do not leave Jerusalem until you have heard from the Lord on from the Father on high because there is a promise that is coming there is an end game to all of that the prophets have talked about the prophetic word in Genesis when God said the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent all the way through the prophets declaring that there would be a Messiah who would come and he would save people from their sins and the Gentiles would walk in this great light and there would be a reunion between God and mankind. He says, go wait. And then on Pentecost Sunday, they're gathered in the upper room and the spirit of the Lord begins to stir and the wind and the fire and the spirit of the Lord descends. And what do they do? They speak in a new languages, languages that were known to other people but not learned by them. It was a miraculous sign. And then Peter stands up, timid Peter, who had 50 days earlier denied Christ, stands up and preaches a sermon. And what happens? 
instead of 3,000 dying like they did when the law was introduced, when the Spirit came, 3,000 came to life. 3,000 came to life because what does the Spirit of the Lord do? The Spirit of the Lord, what does He do? He brings life. And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is healing. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is victory. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is hope. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, the bondages and addictions are broken. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, God is there because He is God. And so today we're going to remember this day and we're going to hold this day sacred. Why? Because Pentecost, let me back up, Passover and Pentecost and the feast that comes in the fall, tabernacles, those were all God's ideas. Those were not men's ideas. That were not men who came up with that concept. It was God saying that I am going to step into time. We call that a kairos. It is an opportunity. It is an intervention of time when God says, I'm going to mark this season because there's something I'm going to do. So what does he do in Pentecost? He pours out his spirit. And what happens? Pentecost is representative of the first harvest. So here's what I want to encourage you to do. I want you to believe that if you joined us in that 21 days of prayer and fasting back in January, you were putting seed in the ground. So now I declare today that that seed begins to bring forth the first harvest. I declare today that for those seeds you put in the ground for that lost loved one, that the Spirit of the Lord is moving right now and somebody is hearing the voice of the Lord right now and they're coming home today. Today somebody is laying in the pig pen and today they are coming to life. They are coming to their senses and they're saying, I'm going home. I'm coming back to the house of God. Somebody's listening to me right now and the Spirit of the Lord is upon you and He's drawing you and He's saying, come home, come home, come home. It's time now to turn and come home. So you put seed in the ground back in January for that situation on your job. And I believe this, that new markets are opening right now. I believe that new territory is opening right now. I believe that businesses and relationships that you developed four, five, ten years ago that didn't bear any fruit. I declare right now that they begin to bear fruit. The phone call comes this week. And they say, do you remember we talked several years ago about that project? I'm ready to do business right now. Some of you have trouble with people on your job. I'm telling you that God is turning your heart and you're getting ready to lead them to the Lord because you've been patient with them, that you've shown them love when they've shown you hate. I'm telling you, the seeds we put in the ground back in January, the harvest is coming right now. Some of you put seed in the ground because you've been infertile. You've been infertile and you can't have babies. Come on. I speak to the womb right now and I speak to the seed and I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to be fruitful and multiply. And this time, by this time next year, you'll be holding that baby because God has done a marvelous thing. He has poured out His Spirit, His Spirit that brings life, His Spirit that brings hope. Some of you put seed in the ground because you have been rocked in your brain and depression and darkness has been around you. Oh, Now y'all know we can't talk about Pentecost and I'm not speaking tongues. Come on, what did I just say, pastor? I don't know, I just know this in my spirit. I was seeing things and I got so overwhelmed with the joy of God, so here's what I believe. I believe when I said what I just said that I was worshiping Him. Because that's what happened in the book of Acts. When they spoke in tongues, they magnified God and they prophesied. So right now in the name of Jesus Christ, indulge me for just a moment. I'm going to speak in tongues. It's in the scripture and we'll talk about it here in just a few minutes. But, but if you pray in the spirit, you have a prayer language that God has given you. You don't have to shout and you don't have to run. You don't have to go crazy. But I want you to just begin to just pray in the spirit right now. Right there in every campus, right there in Colleyville, Crossroads, in the online community. Come on, just begin to give God praise in your heavenly language. 
Oh God, we praise you. We magnify you. Father, we thank you that your spirit is here, that God, you poured yourself out and you've given us a language, God, to speak, Lord God, your will, to speak your purpose. And today, God, let the harvest come up right now in the name of Jesus. What is the harvest? What is the seed that you've sown in the past? Because Pentecost was the beginning, the giving of thanks for the, for the initial harvest of the crop that was planted earlier this year. Oh, there's some of you whose hearts are broken because you've lost loved ones and your world is reeling right now. And, and it seems as if you can't put two thoughts together. And, and it's hard to put one foot in front of the other. You feel so lost. You feel so disconnected. I'm here today to tell you that the Holy Spirit is going to surround you and he's going to cover you and he's going to give you a big hug and he's going to cover you like a finely tailored garment. So come on, just receive the love of God right now. Receive the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Receive the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Receive the comfort of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord. And the reason why we're celebrating Pentecost is because of Christ. Jesus said the Holy Spirit is going to, he's the spirit of truth. He's going to lead you into all truth. And he's going to tell you. And he's going to remind you of the things I said. And he's going to show you things to come. Jesus said, I have to go. If I don't go, the Holy Spirit can't come. The terms he used in the King James verse, it's expedient. It's necessary. It's of utmost importance that I leave. So here's what I'm going to tell you. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is God. And let me tell you what he helps us do. He helps us commune and fellowship. Paul said this, may the grace of our Lord and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon you. He helps us interact and to relate. He's our translator between heaven and earth. He puts things in order. But none of this is possible without Jesus. And so we're going to receive communion to remember what he did, that he lived, that he died, that he was raised from the dead and we proclaim him raised from the dead now. I believe as we receive communion in every campus and in the online community, I believe that there's going to be healing in this house. So if you need healing, come on, this is your time to get your faith up now. Come on, if you need healing, this is the time. If you need clarity, this is your time right now. If you need something worked out and you don't have a solution to the problem now, clarity is coming. If you need hope, if you need depression, lift it off. It's going to happen right now. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord is here. And miracles can happen right now. The Spirit of the Lord is here. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he blessed it and he gave thanks. And he said, this bread is representative of my body. The thing about bread is bread is available. And if you're from Asia, the symbolism would not be bread, it would be rice. It is the basic sustenance of life and is the life that we can all partake of that gives us nourishment. And so Jesus says, my body is broken for you. Representative of his will, submitted to his father. Remember in the garden, he says, not my will, but your will be done. That's where we all have to come every single day to say to God, not my will, but your will be done. So the bread was broken and he blessed it. Father, we thank you for the broken body of Jesus Christ. And God, he said this, that if a seed falls into the ground and it just remains unbroken, it will not produce fruit. But if that seed goes into the ground and it's buried and then it bursts open, it's broken, then the power of that seed is released. Jesus, when your body was broken, you released healing. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Come on, receive your healing right now. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he blessed it. 
And he says, this cup is representative of my blood. Without the shedding of blood, because life is contained in the blood, without the shedding of that, there is no removal. There is no remission of sin. There is no taking away of sin. What did his shed blood do? It removed the power that sin has over us. This is why Paul could say, sin shall not have dominion over you. What did the blood of Christ do? It not only uh, eliminated the power, broke the power of sin, but it also did this. It removed the penalty of sin. What is the penalty of sin? Is death. He came to give us life and more abundantly. And so as we partake of this cup, I want you to drink to the life of the Spirit. The Scripture says this, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. We are free. We are free to love. We are free to live. We are free to know Him. We are free to grow in our relationship and in our communion and fellowship with Him. By doing that, we have life in complete, total abundance. Jesus, we thank you that you shed your blood. We thank you that it's representative of your covenant that you've made with us forever. And we remember the covenant. And Lord, we receive every provision that your covenant has purchased for us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, Josh, let's just sing that. The Spirit of the Lord is here. Let's just worship for about three minutes on all of the campuses. your faith up today. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the power of your presence that's here right now. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you have anointed us and anointed your word. So Holy Spirit, move. You have free reign in our hearts, free reign in our minds, free reign in our bodies. We submit ourselves to you. And Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're doing a great work. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all. Come on, he's awesome. You may be seated. We've been in the book of Acts since just after Easter, and we've been looking at the work of the Holy Spirit. 
And one of the things that I want us to do, if you have your Bible or your electronic device, let's turn to Acts, the 19th chapter. I'm going to be very quick here because the Spirit of the Lord has done His work and He's moving even right now. I want you to keep your expectancy up. You know, God moves. The Scripture says that those that come to God must first believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So God moves when a demand is placed on him. The woman who had the issue of uh, blood had this issue for 12 years, Jesus walking through the crowd, and at the end of the, 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 the experience as recorded in the scripture, she presses through the crowd, she presses through her own uh, mental uh, incapabilities, she presses through all of the the cultural things that says she shouldn't even be there. But what does she do? She makes a demand on the anointing of God. She touches the hem of Jesus' garment and she gets healed. Come on, I want you to keep your expectancy up in Carrollton, in Crossroads, in McKinney, in Colleyville. Acts the 19th chapter, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said into John's baptism. And then John, and then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 in all. So here's what's going on. This is Paul's third missionary journey, and his goal as uh, he's on these missionary trips is to strengthen the church and to put things in order where their people were out of line with doctrine or didn't have full understanding. He had the revelation. He's writing these letters. He's putting things in order. He's putting leaders in place. And then he, this encounter that we see in Acts 19 is about 20 years after Acts 2. 20 years after Acts 2. And uh, in Acts 2, we know what happened. There was the first time that the Holy Spirit came. The people spoke in tongues. They magnified God. Peter preached and 3,000 came, and then there was just this explosive energy released in Jerusalem and in that area. So Paul is now in Ephesus, and he's interacting with the disciples of John the Baptist. Now, we all know that John the Baptist, when he came, he was the forerunner of Christ. He came to prepare the way for the Lord, and John the Baptist preached a baptism of repentance. It was a baptism of repentance. He says, repent from your wicked deeds and get ready for the coming of the king. And according to this text, John's disciples believed that Jesus was the Messiah because remember Jesus, that John said when he saw Jesus coming by the Jordan, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the, uh, the, sin of the world. So they believed that he was the Messiah, but here's what happened. 20 years later, they do not know that Christ has died. They do not know that he's been raised from the dead, and they do not know that the Holy Spirit has come. So this is why Paul begins now to figure out and try to figure out where are you all in relationship to the revelation that God has imparted in the earth? And you know what is amazing? What is so amazing is that these people had the right heart. They were trying to do the right things by God, but they had no idea that God was moving. And the reality is, is that we have so many people right now who are ignorant of what God is doing and what he's done through Jesus Christ, even in the body. You know why? Because we let the culture shape our philosophy. We let the culture shape our perspective instead of the word of God. So when Paul asked about their baptism, he's asking them for the meaning of the significance of their baptism. And you know, I've told you this, that I got baptized at six years old. And I can tell you what the significance of my baptism at six years old was. It was to get that crackers and grape juice because we had three hour long services. The baptism didn't mean a thing to me at six except for I can eat on first Sunday because we've been in church for like five hours. 
Here's the bottom line. The significance of baptism was that Jesus Christ had died for our sins and we could live forever. And after he properly, after they are properly instructed, then they get baptized in the name of Jesus, and then they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, exactly the way the disciples did in Acts chapter 2. So I'm going to very quickly go through, and you've heard me say this without expounding upon it, Uh, You've heard me say that in the early churches, we look through Acts 2 and we look through Acts 8 and Acts 10 and Acts 14, which covers a period of almost 20 to 25 years and other things in the book of Acts. We see four initiations into the community of believers. And what I want to do very quickly is I want you to identify yourself. Identify yourself and see if you really are connected to the body of Christ according to the pattern of what we saw in the Old Testament. I'm going to spend some time on this first point. So what was the first what was the first initiation? It was repentance from sin. It was repentance from sin. And in Matthew the 5th chapter, Jesus in the beatitudes he says this, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. So if we're going to repent from sin, it's going to take humility to admit that I'm wrong and God is right. We live in a culture now, speak your truth. Y'all know, y'all hear it all the time, my truth. No, truth is truth. And let me tell you, the greatest truth is the truth of God's word. So God says this. He says, no sex until you marry. And you know what we say? We say, but we got needs and we're lonely. (laughs) What you say? Hey! (laughs) <laughs> no stones. I'm just, I'm just putting stuff out here. God says, don't hate. And we say, but they were ugly to me first. And I'm tired of turning the other cheek. God says, look out for others, not just for yourself. And we say, I've got my own. Let them get their own. You see, we have all of these paradigms in our mind that are absolutely contrary to the word of God. God says, I sent my son Jesus and he died for your sins so we can experience life to the fullest. And we say there is no such thing as sin. I didn't need anyone to die for me. Here's what I've heard people tell me this when I begin to to share the love of God. They say, I'm good. I'm good. I don't need Jesus. But see, here's what I'm going to tell you. Repentance is personal. And though it, it takes humility to say I, I'm wrong and God is right, let me tell you what, what it also takes. It takes power to live, to do what God says do. It takes power. And where does that power come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit. You see, repentance is personal. And you can't compare yourself. Well, you know what? They're doing such and such, and I think I'm doing better than them. I don't do this and they do that. And we start comparing ourselves to one another, trying to determine what the standard of right and wrong and what good and bad is when God is the established standard. Here's the truth. Many of us did things as teenagers in high school, things that we would be embarrassed for to show up on the front page of the newspaper. But we did it. Why? Because we had friends who were doing it. Friends who were making dumb decisions, and we knew we didn't have any business. Like one Friday night, we decided we're going to egg houses. Why would we egg houses? That's stupid. That's just stupid. And we got to one house, and it just so happened that the father and the son were standing outside when we launched the eggs. (laughs) Good thing we had that 1974 Chevy Nova with a 354 barrel carburetor. Because let me tell you something, they jumped in their car and there was a chase all over Alexandria. But that Nova outran them that night. (laughs) Stupid things that we did because other people were involved and we said we're going to go and we did not do what was right. You see, you'll have to stand before God and you have to give an account for how you responded to Christ. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28 says this, that, that just as people are destined to die once and then after that, comes the judgment. They have to face the judgment. So Christ was sacrificed, wants to take away the sins of many and will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Here's the bottom line. The first initiation into the body of Christ was the repentance from sin. And my question is, have you repented? 
Are you living in such a way that your life does not accord with the word? Because my word of encouragement and challenge, no stones, but you should repent. You need to change your mind. You need to say the direction I'm going in right now is wrong. And here's what you need to do. You need to turn around. And you need to run to God as fast as you can. As fast as you can, repent. This is what Jesus declared when he came. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's a new system. There's a new order. There's a new sheriff in town. Come under my authority. Come under my lordship. And I'm going to give you life and life in abundance. So repent. That was the first thing that they did to come into the kingdom of God. The second thing that they did when they came and became a part, initiated into the community of believers was the acceptance of Jesus as Lord the acceptance of Jesus as Lord. Now, our mission here at Covenant Church is to be fully surrendered followers of Christ. That's our mission, is to be fully surrendered followers of Christ. So what does that mean? It means that our will is completely and totally submitted to Christ. It means that our belief, our values, our actions are viewed from the perspective of God's word and where there is a conflict between what I've learned, what I've known, what I was taught, and and God's word, then God's word is the final authority. So in other words, I make my life line up with God's word. I don't make God's word line up with my life. Come on, as a church, this is the way things were In in the beginning, in the first church. They repented of their sins, and then they acknowledged Jesus Christ as a Lord. So when we talk about becoming fully uh, fully de- uh, developed, develop fully surrendered followers of Christ, our mission is this. What is it? Know God, find freedom, discover your purpose so that you can make a difference. What does that look like practic? I'm going to give you four things that we use as a measuring tool as to how we know that you're moving to that place of being fully surrendered. Here's, a, here's the first one, that you connect to a small group. If you're going to be a part of the Covenant Church organization, here's what I'm going to challenge you. Everybody needs to be in a small group. Everybody needs to be talking to Roger in small groups. How'd y'all like that commercial? That was pretty cool, right? (laughs) Here's the second thing. You serve on a dream team. These are the practical expressions. Now, does, does that indicate that something is at work in your heart? We'll talk about it in just a moment. We need to attend services consistently. And we need to tithe. So here's what you can say right now. Are you doing all four of those? If you are, then you are being a fully surrendered follower of Christ. Now, I've got some news for you. We've got work to do. Because as we look at the number of people who are in circulation here at Covenant, guess what we found out? That that fully surrendered category in a small group, on a dream team, attending church on a regular basis, whether it's online or in person, and tithing, that number is significantly lower than you would even imagine. You're saying, Pastor, what is the number? How many fully surrendered do we have? I'm not going to even tell you. Because the only question you need to be asking is, am I in that number? (laughs) And if you're not in that number, you got work to do. Now, let's just talk about that. Here's the bottom line. Being fully surrendered, a fully surrendered follower of Christ, we can check the boxes. It's easy to check the box. I'm in a small group. I'm I'm on a dream team. I tithe. I attend church regularly. But we don't want you just checking the box because to be fully surrendered is to have a heart and a love for Christ. Uh, Being in a small group, being on a dream team, tithing, attending church regularly, all of those are just byproducts of the transformed heart that has fallen in love with God and is willing to do what God has called us to do. You see, the Pharisees checked all the boxes. They knew the word inside out. They gave money to help the poor. They attended church daily. Do you remember the story of the rich young ruler? He comes to Jesus and says, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you know, don't kill, don't steal, uh, don't, you know, honor your mom and your dad and, and treat other people right. And he says, I've done that. And then Jesus says, hey, why don't you go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. And what did the dude do? He hung his head and he walked out. Why did he do it? The scripture says he had great wealth. What was the one commandment that Jesus didn't quote? You should have no other gods before me. So he, he had checked the boxes on a rela- how it relates to people. I'm doing everything I can to treat people right, 
But the one problem I have is, is God is not first in my life. This is where we want you to come. So they gave, they became fully surrendered to Christ. They accepted Jesus as Lord. Here's the third initiation. It's water baptism. What is water baptism? It is the public profession and acknowledgement that you've changed allegiances from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It is an emblem of burial and cleansing. The old life is being buried and the new life is the result of being raised from the dead. Jesus himself ordained baptism in Matthew, the 28th chapter, verse 18. He gives us the great commission, go into all the world, preach the gospel, and I make disciples, and I've given you authority in heaven and earth, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to make disciples of all the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What does baptism do? It unites us with Christ in his death and his resurrection. His death, his burial, and his resurrection. Now, some of you all were sprinkled when you were little because you were in denominations where they sprinkled you. And you know what? Here's the bottom line. In the Greek, the word for baptism in the Greek is baptizo, and it means to be immersed. It means to be identified with Christ. So let me ask you this question. Was Christ buried? Was he put halfway in the tomb, kind of left hanging out? oh, man, we got a problem here. The, the, the stone, it won't close because Jesus is like halfway in. You ever been to a funeral where, where they put the casket in the ground or the vault in the ground and then they throw like two little shovels of dirt on everybody walk and say, oh, we're done for the day, guys. No, what happens? It's completely buried. And so here's what I'm telling you, that if you have not been completely submerged, that doesn't mean your baptism wasn't valid. I'm just telling you, you need to do like I did at 21 years old when I came to Covenant Church or 22 years old. I began to say, man, baptism didn't mean a thing to me. I was baptized in the bayou and that water was cold too. It was April. It was so cold. And let me tell you, I went into, I went into the water and I was thinking there's got to be some snakes and some alligators around here somewhere. I was, uh, Y'all hurry and get me out of here. You talking too long, preacher. You know, I wanted to get out of that water. But, you know, when I got out of the water, I was excited. Last Sunday, I can't eat crackers and juice. That's all it meant. When I came to Covenant, I realized, man, I've been serving God now for about four or five years, and I've never publicly acknowledged that by identifying with him in his death, his burial, and resurrection. Somebody needs to get baptized. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do right now. I want you to pull out your phone and text to 64600 the word baptism. Because what we're going to do, based on how many people text in and say, I need to get baptized or I need to get rebaptized, we're going to have some baptisms in June, okay? This is what we're going to do. Why? Because this was an initiation. Okay, I've got to close it out. The fourth initiation in the scripture was this. It was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, listen to this. 120 in Acts 2. 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues, or if you want to say in an unlearned language. In Acts 4, Samaria, five years later, this is five years after Acts 2, they were all, the scripture says, filled with the Holy Spirit, and there was an implication that they all spoke in this unlearned language. In Acts the 10, in Caesarea with Cornelius the centurion, this is 10 years after Acts 2, the scripture says that all of Cornelius' household was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues and magnified God. Can you see a pattern? And then we move to Acts 19, where I just read from 20 years later in Ephesus, they repent They acknowledge Jesus as the Lord. They get baptized in water. Holy Spirit comes upon them. Now, all of these don't have to happen in order. The baptism with water and the baptism of the Spirit, they could be interchanged as to when that happens. Now, here's what I want to say as I close. We see the pattern, Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19. Here's what I want you to know. Though... Luke closes out the book of Acts, talking about Paul's last things and his missionary journey up to that point. The book of Acts is still being written. And here's a question that I have. What's the story 
that we're going to tell? What is the story that's going to be told about us because it's still being written? Is the Holy Spirit present right now? Do we speak in tongues right now? Absolutely. Is God still healing people? Absolutely. Is God still saving people? Absolutely. Are people still being set free? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what's the value of speaking in tongues? I'm going to go through this really quickly. Paul takes time to talk about this in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. I'm just going to give you a list. You can go back and study for yourself. When we speak in that unlearned language that the scripture, King James says tongues, the scripture says this, we're speaking directly to God. God understands it. Or we're walking by faith. So when I say, you don't understand a thing but God does. And I have to accept that by faith because the word does. That's not weird. We don't need to wear it out on this thing. What did you just say, Pastor Ricky? I, I didn't quite get the interpretation because here's what Paul said, pray that you can interpret. But there are times when I speak in tongues, I know that I'm either praying for someone or I'm worshiping God. I just, in my heart, I just know which one it is. I might not know what I'm saying. Here's what it also says in, in 1 Corinthians 14. It says that when I speak in unknown language, I'm speaking to God. The second thing it says that I'm declaring the divine mysteries of God. The word mysteries in the Greek is the will of God. So anything that I'm saying right now, I'm declaring the will of God. This is why I literally pray in my unknown language more than I pray in English. You know why? Because my mind is so many. Thank you, Jesus. And there's so many other things that you can say. And then you just run out of things until you start getting rep repetitious in your prayer. But when I'm praying... And this is the third point. It says when we pray in our own tongue, it says our spirit is praying. Our mind is not understanding. Our mind is not fruitful. So guess what? Our spirit has limited capacity. Why? Because it's spiritual. So I can I can do that for hours. Hours. But here's another thing that the word says, that when we pray in, in that unknown language, that we are building ourselves up. It's like if we could see ourselves as a lithium battery. You know, lithium batteries have to be recharged, right? Where every time, when I'm praying in the spirit, then guess what I'm doing? I'm being plugged into the power source. And I can tell you at 18 years old, I was saying to myself, I want to be plugged into a power source because I want to live holy. I want to live right for God. I want to be an example to other people. And when they look at Ricky Tejada, I want to say, there's a real Christian. And I recognize at 18, I cannot do this without power. And so I was hungry. And I said, God, whatever you have for me that is going to help me live this Christian life, to say no to temptation and testing and sin and to eventually grow to a place where sin doesn't have reign over me. I want the power. Paul said this, so what do we do? He says we pray in the Spirit. And we pray in understanding. God, I just thank you for blessing your people today. I thank you, God, that your people are whole. They're anointed. They're free, God. He says, what am I going to do? He says, we sing in the spirit. What were you singing, Pastor? I don't know the words. I just know I was worshiping because I just felt the presence of God just come on me. So I sing with the Spirit, and then I sing with understanding. Miracles are happening now because the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around for the Spirit of the Lord is here. So you can do both of those. Now, let me just tell you about this baptism of the Holy Spirit and this speaking in this unknown language. It allows you to move into the realm of the Spirit. Do you realize that we're spiritual beings? And so it is a spiritual act that moves us into the realm 
of power and authority where God intends us to live in and function in every single day. God does not intend, even though we're weak and we're in the flesh, he doesn't intend for us to get in the flesh and get ticked off with people and and have bad thoughts about people or bad thoughts about ourselves. God's intention is that we live in this presence where we have full clarity and insight. And when we can't see our way, the trust that we have in God is so strong that we're never afraid. Never afraid. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord is here. Come on, my worship team. Let's stand to our feet. Everybody on every campus, pastors get ready to take the campus. But here's what I want you to do right now. So the four initiations into the community of believers was repentance from sin It was the acknowledgement of Jesus as Lord, means you give him full control of your life. It was water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All I can tell you is I want everything God has for me, everything. Now, in the environment, what was going on in Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19? Here's what I can tell you. There was an expectancy there. There was this incredible expectancy. Think about in Acts 2, they've been waiting 10 days. They had been praying together for 10 days. And so there was this atmosphere was charged. What about in Samaria? The gospel had been preached. They invited Christ into their hearts. So Peter and John say, man, we need to go to Samaria. So they're waiting on Peter and John to come. And there's this expectancy. What happened in Acts 10 is Cornelius, who's been giving his alms to the poor, and he's been doing good deeds. And he has a vision to say, hey, there's a guy named Peter, and he's on the street called Straight. Send somebody to go get him. He's going to come with a message for you. And then think about this. Three days later, Peter shows up, and Cornelius is like, dang. God really spoke to me. That's cool. But he'd been waiting three days. There was an expectancy. There was a hunger. Jesus said this in John 7, 37. He says this, that he stood on the last day of the feast, which was the Feast of Tabernacles. It was the big feast in the fall. And he says, if anyone is thirsty, let them come to me and drink. And out of their innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And then verse 38 says, but he was speaking about the Holy Spirit who had not yet come. Let me ask you this question. Do you want rivers of of living water flowing out of you? Then you got to get hungry. You have to create an atmosphere. Here's the final thing. Scripture says that they spoke in tongues. See, when you hear people talking about tongues, you think the Holy Spirit's like, oh, ah." you know, we're going to get, oh, that, oh, ah, oh, ah." what's that, the gritty? Is that how they do the gritty? Think the Holy Spirit gonna come on you and like like do the gritty for you? How how they do that? Well, oh, I gotta get my. I'm gonna get that gritty right between services. He's not gonna jump on you and then take control of your mouth. Watch this. So I spoke. He didn't speak. I did. But what am I doing? What am I doing now? If I'm speaking in English. There are thoughts being formulated in my mind and I'm speaking them out and you understand it because I'm speaking in English. There are constant thoughts that the Holy Spirit is speaking. But when we say, we are releasing his thoughts. That's why the word says we're speaking the will of God. Now let me ask you this question. Do you want to speak the will of God? I do. Do you want the power of God manifesting? Yeah. When people say, Pastor, pray for me. And, and I don't know how to pray. You know what I say to him? I'm going to pray in the spirit right quick. Do you mind? Because when I pray in the spirit, I get clarity. And when I start praying in the spirit for people, I start seeing images or I'll see a name or I'll see a picture. I'll see something or something like will pop into my mind. And you, I can't tell you the number of times where people say, Pastor, I didn't even tell you what to pray for, but you prayed for exactly what I needed. It's the Holy Spirit. He knows everything and he works with us. Okay, we're out of time. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. Because the first thing that we're going to do is I want you that if you need to repent, if you need to make Jesus Lord of your life, if you need to rededicate your heart, I want you to just raise your hand. Raise your hand right here in the sanctuary. Raise it high. I want to see it high. You want to publicly acknowledge that you need Jesus. I see hands. I see hands all over the sanctuary. Anybody up in the balcony, you need to make things right with God. Today's your day. Come on, God has forgiven you of your sin and he loves you. Right there in Colleyville, raise your hand. McKinney, Crossroads, online, touch that button that says raise your hand. 
Raise your hand right now. Anybody else? Come on. This is the time. The Spirit of the Lord is here. It's not time for you to be hard-headed. Remember what I said? Repentance requires humility. And when you humble yourself before God, God begins to give you grace. He gives you the power to say yes to Him. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do now. On every campus, that online community, you can't walk down the aisle, but you can raise that hand and our team is right there to, to serve you. But everybody who is in a campus, I want you to now to come out of your seat. Come on, it's going to take courage, and I want to meet you down here in the altar, and we're going to pray for you. Come on, come on. We're going to sing as you come. You raise your hand. Come on down. Be the one. Be the one who's saying, man, I'm getting it right with God right now. Come on. Yes. God bless you. Come on. Pastors, you can take it at your campus. God bless you all. Have an awesome day. Come on. Let's sing. Come on. Come into the King. Come on. Let's give him a hand. Let's celebrate this. excited for you all. Do y'all see all these young people that are up here? Thank you. The Spirit of the Lord is for you. God is for you. Today is the day of new beginnings. God loves you. I don't care how bad you think you've messed up. You've never messed up bad enough for God to say, get out of here. Let me tell you, I want you to never forget this image. When you come to God, he's like this. Come. He's always like this. He's never like this. And he's never like this. He'll never turn his back on you. He's with you forever, wherever you go. Let me tell you, depression cannot have you. Depression can't have you. No, no, depression can't have you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we break off every spirit of depression. You leave her alone and go in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, let the joy of the Lord be her strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Come on, girl, lift your hand and just begin to give him praise. Just give him praise right now. Open your mouth. Come on, somebody give him praise right now. Give him praise. Open your mouth. Our words create an atmosphere. Depression can't have you. 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 You belong to the king. You belong to him. You belong to him. You belong to the king. You belong to him. He's in love with you. He's passionately, madly, crazy in love with you. He's so in love with you, he can't get you off of his mind 24-7, 365 days a year. He's thinking about you, how he's going to do good things for you, good things in you, good things through you. Mm. 
So let me tell you how you know you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. When, when you feel something so inside of you that you might call emotion, and you want to like, ah, you just want to scream, that means you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because when I get there, I just say, Maro Toro Basha. Oh, And let me just tell you, this getting filled with the Holy Spirit is not a one-time experience because here's what Paul says, don't be drunk like you get drunk with wine. He says, but be filled with the Spirit. It's a daily experience. This is how we can walk in righteousness and holiness and peace and joy. Okay. Y'all are so good. Online team, you're so good. Thank you for being so patient. So here's what I want you, uh, individuals who come here and those of you who are in line, let's say this prayer together. Say this, say, Heavenly Father, I come to you now and I thank you for sending your son Jesus who died for my sin. I'm acknowledging him now. I'm acknowledging your work, Jesus. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you were raised from the dead. I'm prepared to do life with you from this day forever. I accept your covenant of life and of peace and of joy and of communion and fellowship with you. Jesus, wash me now, cleanse me now, give me my fresh start right now. I declare today is a day of new beginnings for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. <laughs> Hallelujah. Our team online's got you. If you're in the online community, we're gonna just have y'all go this way. We got a team waiting on you. We're getting ready to dismiss service, but here's what I wanna do. We're gonna open up the altars and we will pray from now until the start of the next service. If you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then we want you to just come down and say, hey, y'all lay hands on me. That's what they did in the book of Acts. But let me tell you, when you come down, don't just sit there and do it like this. You have to create the environment of I surrender and then give God thanks. Creating an atmosphere and then here's what you do. Release the thoughts of the Spirit. If you're saved, Holy Spirit's in you. I'm not saying you don't have the Holy Spirit if you don't speak in tongues in that heavenly language, because you have the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit wants to be loosed. He wants to be his thoughts permeating the atmosphere. So the altars are open. And if you want to stay for the next service, that'd be awesome too. We absolutely love you all. And remember today is Pentecost. You have put seeds in the ground. You've got seed in the ground that's getting ready to come up. It's coming up. There's a harvest coming up. For some of you, it's a har harvest of comfort because you've helped other people when they were in trouble. Some of you, it's a financial harvest. The first fruits are coming up. Come on, David, I just prophesy over you that your business multiply in the name of Jesus Christ. You're doing your best to walk with the King and he acknowledges that and he respects that and he's going to remember you like he remembered Cornelius in Acts 10 because you've done good. And he's pleased with you. Come on, I'd receive that word. I'd take that for myself. When I'm giving out these words by the Spirit, just take it for yourself. I got that one. Yeah, I, that's me too. All right, y'all ready? <laughs> Expect this week for God to surprise you. I want you to look for something like, okay, what's he getting ready to do right now? You know how it is when your birthday comes around and you know everybody's been acting really funny? and you know something's going on, but you can't put your finger on it, that's how it is with God this week. So you just be looking. Just look. Where is he? What is he doing? Expect God to move on your behalf. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace and cover you with his name, Jesus. The altars are open. You want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. We'll see you on Wednesday morning.